Hi, welcome back. I grew up playing cricket and tennis. I've loved sports all my life, more as a fan now than as a player. But sports fascinate me. So do markets, perhaps not as much as sports. And when the two come together, as you, they often do, I'm doubly fascinated. Money in sports fascinates me. And in a sense, the time is right now to talk about money in sports because it looks like the sporting world has blown a gasket. As you look at news stories about players signing immense contracts or people paying huge prices for franchises, I wouldn't blame you if you said, what the heck is going on? How do you explain these numbers? Now, I'm going to try and I might not succeed, but let's go back and look at the ideal behind sports. I know we're not supposed to talk about money in sports. The ideal is it's about competition, about the human spirit. What's money got to do with it? In fact, that was the ideal behind the Olympics, banning athletes from making money from competing. And tennis, banning professionals from their biggest tournaments. Of course, it is hypocritical because these entities, while they ban the players on the field from making money, made tons of money themselves. I don't think there are too many people left on the face of the earth who would argue that sports and money have nothing to do with each other. There's lots of money in sports and often decisions in sports are driven more by money than sporting ideals. Now let's look at the stories in sports that might have caught your attention. The money in sports has been increasing over time, but there are stories in the last two years that suggest that the sporting business might have blown a financial gasket. Let's start with player contracts. You probably read the news that Al Hilal, the Saudi soccer team, offered almost a billion dollars to Kylian Mbappé, the, the French super soccer superstar. He, of course, turned it down. But a billion dollars to play for one year? Now, those of you who are baseball fans in the U.S. have probably been reading stories about Shohei Otani, the Japanese superstar, perhaps the best player in baseball. And the contract he might get next year when he signs as a free agent, 700 million, 800 million. You also probably been reading about sports franchises being bought and sold for numbers that are mind boggling. The Washington Commanders, an American football team with a very middling record, in fact, a very poor record over the last decade, recently sold for more than $6 billion. And it's part of a stretch of transactions across franchises across the world where you're getting mind-boggling prices for sports franchises. Now, the franchises themselves are getting disrupted by money. Those of you who've been tracking golf know that in 2022, the Saudis appended golf by creating LIV, um, a league where they signed the biggest names in golf. Initially, the PGA said, look, we're not worried. No, there's no way this is going to happen. A year later, the PGA has conceded that LIV has won the game. And finally, the broadcasting of sports, you've seen money kind of explode as well. The NFL, the most profitable sporting franchise in the world in 2021, entered into a 10-year contract that is going to deliver almost $115 billion to the franchise and broadcasting revenues. It's going to be shared across teams. It's not just in the U.S. you're seeing these immense amounts being paid for TV rights. The IPL, the Indian Cricket League, recently signed a five-year contract for about six billion U.S. dollars. Clearly, money in sports is exploding and people are looking at the sizes of these contracts there. How can you justify them? Now, let's look at franchise prices. If you look at the biggest franchise transactions that have occurred over time, you look at, take the 10 biggest. Five of the biggest have occurred just in the last two years. The five biggest. The Washington Commanders that I talked about, 6 billion plus. Chelsea, the Premier League for 5.3 billion. The Denver Broncos for 4.7 billion. And two NBA teams that recently went for 3.5 and, and 4 billion. Clearly, franchise prices are rising. And you might think that this is selective, but you can see this in this graph where it looks at all U.S. sports franchise transactions from 1998 to 2023 graphed out. Now, you can take a look for yourself, but the size of the pie tells you how big the transaction. And you can see as you go rightwards in the graph from 1998 to 2023, the transactions are getting bigger. Clearly, 
people are paying more for sports franchises. Now you might say that it can be explained by TV revenues. You can hold off on that because we can come back and see if we can explain them with financials, but clearly higher prices are being paid for franchises around the world. Now, for those of you who read Forbes, one of the most read Forbes you know, uh, tables each year is the tables they put together where they price different sporting franchises, price the NFL teams, the Major League Baseball. Basically, they, they price not just U.S. sports franchises, but they, 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 they price you know, soccer teams in the U.K., the IPL teams. Focusing just on the NFL, if you look at the Forbes pricing of teams, you notice the word I use, pricing, as opposed to valuation, I'll come back and explain it. Even though there are relatively few transactions, Forbes seems to pull off this miraculous feed and price every team. It's not that miraculous after you get under the surface, but the collective pricing for NFL teams has gone from about, on the average team, from about 1.17 billion in 2012 to almost 4.14 billion in 2022. It's increased almost fourfold. Clearly, the pricing jump can be seen across time. And if you look across franchises, at least according to the NFL, you look at the cumulative pricing for all the teams in a franchise, the NFL is at top with 132.5 billion, followed by the NBA at 85.9 billion, Major League Baseball at 69.6 billion, the NHL and MLS come in at the bottom of the ranks for US franchises. But the Major League Soccer surprisingly has a $16.2 billion collective pricing. The 20 top Premier League teams and just the 20 is 30.2 billion. If you bring in the rest of soccer, my guess is soccer would rise to up the list, perhaps higher than the NBA, close to the NFL. And finally, if you look at the IPL teams, there are 10 of them, the cumulative pricing is about 10.4 billion. As a, just a, for the moment, if you look at the next two, next two columns, I look at the highest price and the lowest price teams. And you'll notice that the difference between the highest price and the lowest price teams is lowest in the NFL and the IPL and higher in the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NHL. We'll come back and talk about why that might be, why there's so much divergence in pricing across teams. Now, there is a small subset of sports franchises that are publicly traded. In the U.S., the, the perhaps the, the, one, the only one of any substance is Madison Square Garden Sports, which owns Madison Square Garden and gets revenues from concerts and other events, but also owns the Knicks and the Rangers. It is closely held and controlled by the Dolan family. Outside of the U.S., the best-known publicly traded sports franchise is probably Manchester United. That's been publicly traded for a while, but it's again closely held and controlled by the Glazer family. There are a handful of European sports soccer teams that are traded, but collectively, if you look at sports franchises, very few are publicly traded. That's a little surprising given that the pricing is in the tens of billions of dollars, and we'll come back and address why that might be most sports franchises remain privately held. So let me go back to the word that I use when I describe what Forbes did to come up with numbers for the franchise. I said they priced them, didn't value them. To illustrate this, I'm going to go back to something I've talked about before, and I'm sorry if I'm boring you by repeating this, but I make a big deal in my classes, in my books, about the difference between two words, price and value. We know what drives value. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. It's fundamentals. It's business models. We also know what drives price. It's demand and supply. Now, if your reaction is, aren't demand and supply driven by the same financial fundamentals? Perhaps. But they're also driven by mood and momentum behavior of forces. You can price something or you can value something. And you can get very different numbers depending on the processes. Because to value something, the tools you use include intrinsic valuation, discounted cash flow models, where you're trying to grapple with estimating cash flows, growth, and risk. The tools for pricing are much simpler. You pay based on what other people are paying for similar things. Remember the point I made about Forbes pricing franchises? Forbes doesn't do an intrinsic valuation of every franchise. You know how they come up with the numbers? They look at what people are paying for, 
for, for, for franchises. Remember that transaction price page that I showed you? And they adjust the pricing of every single team based on the most recent transactions. I'll make a prediction. The pricing you saw for the NFL in 2022, you're going to see a jump of about eight, maybe 10% this year. You know why? Because in the 2022 estimate of the commander's pricing, Forbes had estimated a price of about 5.6 billion, but it just sold for 6.05 billion. They are undershot by about 10%. You're going to see that play out in every pricing. The Dallas Cowboys, the most highly priced NFL franchise, will get even more highly priced. Forbes prices, sporting franchises. It's not meant as a critique, it is what it is. Now you're saying, so what? Now one of the things about pricing versus valuation is when you look at investments, you have to ask yourself, can I value an investment? Now normal asset has cash flows, expected cash flows. You can value it based on expected cash flows. What is a normal asset, a business, a stock, a bond? You can also price it by looking at what other people are paying for similar companies. Assets can be both priced and valued. In fact, you can classify almost every investment philosophy out there based on which pathway you take. You can broadly divide the world or people in the marketplace into two groups. You have investors who try to value assets and try to buy them at prices less than value. You have traders. What do traders do? They buy at a low price, they sell at a high price. Assets can be both valued and priced. But your investment could be a commodity. If you ask me what is the fair value for gold or oil, my answer is I have no idea, but I can price it. I can price it based on demand and supply, based on history. Current currencies cannot be valued. It's a point that you might have heard me make when I looked at Bitcoin and somebody asked the question, what is the fair value for Bitcoin? Bitcoin, if it's a currency, cannot be valued. It can be priced relative to other currencies. That's what an exchange rate is. You can talk about good or bad currencies and which one should be priced higher, but they can only be priced. And collectibles, like Picassos, can only be priced. When you have something that can only be priced, like a currency or a collectible, you can only trade. You cannot invest in a currency. You cannot invest in a collectible. You can trade it. Assets can be traded or invested in it, and you can make a choice. Now, in my original categorization, I stopped with these four groupings. But there's a fifth grouping of assets or investments that I'm going to call trophy assets. What are trophy assets? Like regular assets, they have expected cash flows. You can value them like assets. But they're also like collectibles. In other words, you buy them for their emotional dividends, for the other factors, the other advantages you get by owning them. When you have a trophy asset, the pricing can not just deviate from the value, it can stay different from the value. So let's take a look at what goes into a trophy asset. What, the, what are the ingredients that make for a trophy asset? The first is, in a trophy asset, the emotional appeal overwhelms the financial characteristics of the asset. So now the, you, know, you can look at the cash flows, the growth and the risk to come up with the value for these assets. But there's another repeal to these assets that goes well beyond the financials. Second, trophy assets tend to be unique. Why? Because if they have that emotional appeal, it's because they're special, they're different. It goes with the uniqueness, goes the scarcity. You can't have trophy assets that everybody can possess. It can go to a small and a very small subset of people. And finally, the people buying trophy assets are buying it not for financial reasons, but for the other emotional dividends they get out of it. So that's what makes for a trophy asset. Saying, so what are the implications of something being a trophy asset? When you have a trophy asset, it's going to look massively overpriced relative to other assets which don't have that trophy status. And as price rises above value and a gap opens up, unlike traditional assets, we expect the gap to close in a trophy asset. The price can deviate from the value and stay deviated because the buyers buying these trophy assets are not buying them because of the financial reason. They come in knowing they're paying too much. And finally, because trophy assets don't derive the value from financial fundamentals, the link between what gets paid for trophy assets and financials will tend to be weak. With that in mind, let me make a case for why sports franchises increasingly are trophy assets. 
1932, when Art Rooney bought the Pittsburgh Steelers, the NFL franchise, he bought for $2,500. I'm sure Art Rooney did not buy the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1932 to get a trophy. He bought it as a business. The NFL was this minor franchise that didn't have an organized uh, league where you had championships. He bought it as a business. And for a long time in the U.S., people bought sports franchises as businesses. Increasingly, three things I think are changing that make sports franchises less traditional assets and more trophy assets. The first is the fundamentals of the business are changing for sports franchises. 1932, if you bought a sports franchise or even the 1940s or 50s or even the 60s, the bulk of your, of your, of your revenue came from the gate receipts, people paying for tickets and watching your team play. Now, and perhaps they spent money on food and merchandise when they came to the game. Increasingly, and, as I'm, and I'm going to back this up, Sports franchise, sports businesses around the world are becoming media businesses. The bulk of the revenues don't come from gate receipts. They come from broadcasting contracts. The second is, and I'll again back this up, there's an increasing disconnect between what people are paying for sports franchises and the fundamentals, the revenues, the earnings of these sports franchises. And third, the kinds of people buying sports franchises are very different than the people buying sports franchises 40 or 50 years ago. I'm going to argue that the characteristic of the new owners is supportive of the notion that they're not buying businesses, they're buying trophies. So let me start with the first piece of that puzzle. In this, um, in this graph, I've looked at U.S. sports franchises collectively and the revenues of these franchises, broken down into three pieces. The red part is the gate receipts, the traditional way in which sports franchises collected revenues. The green part, and it's becoming an increasing part of the entire revenue stream, is the broadcasting revenues of these franchises from TV, streaming. And the purple part is merchandising and sponsorship. The biggest and fastest growing slice of the revenue stream clearly is the broadcasting part. Which means if you want to truly value a sports team today based on financials, you have to understand how the media part of the business works out. And here's where there are differences across different sports franchises. The NFL gets almost all of its money in national TV revenues and it shares it equally across the teams. If you remember in, uh, when I showed you the pricing of franchise of teams in different franchises, the NFL had the least spread between the most, fa most highly priced and the least highly priced. Here's the reason. They get about the same. Re every NFL team gets about the same amount of revenues from, from TV. The ma Major League Baseball, that's not true. The bulk of the revenues for most baseball teams comes from local broadcasting. And local broadcasting revenues are a function of the media market that you serve. A New York team, the New York Yankees, the Mets, is going to have a significant advantage over a Seattle team because the New York media market is so much bigger than the Seattle market. It is true Major League Baseball has tried to have some revenue sharing, but the richest Major League Baseball teams are the ones in the biggest media markets. The NBA, not the NBA, but the NBA, has more nas has national TV, but still local TV accounts for a big chunk of the broadcasting revenues. And the NBA does have a revenue sharing arrangement where the richest team subsidizes the poorest teams, but it's still incomplete. National Hockey League, very similar to the NBA. There's revenue sharing, but the local TV contracts are very different. Major League Soccer is unique. Teams don't have owners. They have investor operators who all invest in Major League Soccer, the franchise itself which collects all television revenues. The Premier League splits its base payments that from TV contracts, but the amount you get in addition depends on how often a team is shown on TV. So the teams that show up on TV more get higher TV revenues. And finally, in the IPL, the share of the media revenue depends on how well or badly the team performs in the field, what its ranking is at the end of the season. Understanding how media revenues get split up among our teams is critical to valuing teams. Now, as media contracts deliver higher revenues, you'd think that teams are getting more profitable, but they're not because here's the other big trend. Player contracts are becoming more expensive. And that's, you know, that's a reflection of the fact that players have more bargaining power, 
more than 50% of the revenues of every single U.S. sporting franchise, the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, goes to player contracts. So if you look at the operating income at sports teams, it's moderate. You know, the most profitable sporting franchise in the world is the NFL, which collectively delivers operating income across all 32 NFL teams. It's about $4.7 billion in revenues of $16 billion. The second most profitable sporting franchise is the NBA. The Major League Baseball, it's not that profitable, only $874 million in collective profits. The NHL is actually more profitable than Major League Baseball. The 20 top Premier League teams have an operating income of $520 million. Again, if I brought in the rest of soccer, it might have a bigger operating income. But the point I'm trying to make is sports franchises are not incredible profit machines. They might be growing revenues from media contracts, but a big chunk of those revenues are being eaten up with higher player contracts. Here's the other trend line you're seeing. There's a, even as revenues might be going up at sports teams, pricing is going up even faster. I'm going to take one franchise here, the NFL and point out the disconnect. Here I'm going to use the Forbes collective pricing of all NFL teams and measure it as a multiple of revenues at NFL teams starting in 2012 going through 2022. So if you look at 2012, the collective pricing of all NFL teams was just about four times revenues. By the time you get to 2022, it's about seven times revenues. So even if your argument for higher prices for franchises is media contracts are getting bigger, it's insufficient because pricing is rising faster than the revenues are. So as an example of how you could value a sports franchise, I'll hark back to a post I did in 2014 when Steve Ballmer, then just stepped down as CEO of Microsoft, bought the Los Angeles Clippers the second NBA team in LA. The reason I say second is LA is a city where the Lakers rule, but the Clippers had moved to LA. He paid $2 billion. And at that time, I tried to value the Clippers to see if I could justify the $2 billion. So if you took the Clipper 2012 numbers, the most recent financial year, the value I came up with was $150 million, not $2 billion. Even if I used the median values across all teams, I came up with $155 million. Even if I assumed that the, the Clippers would have Laker-like revenues, I came up with $735 million. If I put a best, best scenario, every conceivable lever at full lever, I came up with $1.6 billion. The point I was trying to raise was I could not get close to $2 billion no matter how hard I tried. You could try this with the Washington Commanders and see if you can get to $6 billion, take the revenues, the earnings. I'll wager you will not come within spitting distance of six billion. Which brings me to my third rationale, a third argument for why I think sports franchises are now more trophy assets than assets. Not only are the fundamentals of sports business changing, they're becoming media entertainment businesses, and the pricing seems to have disconnected from the fundamentals. The kinds of people who own sports franchises has also changed. Here again, I'm going to take one franchise, the NBA, professional basketball in the U.S., and take the 30 teams in the NBA and look at who owns them. So I've listed the owners in the order of their wealth. The L.A. Clippers are owned by Steve Warmer. His wealth at the time this table was put together was $76 billion because much of his wealth is still down with Microsoft. That could go to 90 or 95 very easily if Microsoft's stock price goes up. He bought the Clippers in 2014. And as you go down the list, you can notice that towards the very bottom of the list, there are some people to, whose portfolios, the, 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 the team they own is in fact the biggest chunk of their value. So if you look at Clay Bennett at the Oklahoma City Thunder or Vivek Ranada, the Sacramento Kings, the biggest portion of their portfolio. But for many people towards the top of the list, you can already see there were billionaires coming in and they made their billions on something else, venture capital, private equity, real estate, oil. And this has especially been true in transaction in more recent years. The days of Art Rooney buying the Pittsburgh Steelers as a business are done. As you look at franchises change hands, you're going to see the people buying these franchises are buying them for very different reasons than the people buying franchises 30, 40, 50 years ago. 
If you're wondering why these billionaires, you know, many financial sav financially savvy would buy a sports franchise that's not that profitable, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and this picture I think gives you the answer. This is Steve Ballmer on the sidelines of the Los Angeles Clippers. Take a look at his face. I've seen Steve Ballmer at you know, annual meetings and earnings you know, calls when he was CEO of Microsoft, which was a long time. I cannot for a second remember him ever looking like this. The, Bar the Clippers are not just another investment in Steve Ballmer's portfolio. They're special to him. Now, we can argue why they're special, but they're special. That is the... F and in, in a sense, you could argue that he, you know, when Steve Ballmer paid $2 billion for the Clippers, he was doing it with open eyes. He wasn't expecting to buy a business worth $2 billion. He's buying a business worth a billion, maybe, to him. The extra billion, what is he paying for? An expensive toy. So if I were to summarize, I'm going to argue that sports franchises are the ultimate trophy assets. First, they're scarce. There are only so many professional sports with standing in the world, and the teams within these sports are contained. The franchises keep that. No, they're scarce. Second, if you buy one of these teams, not only are you fulfilling your childhood dreams in many cases, Steve Cohen, a Mets fan since he was a kid. He now gets to own the team that he's pulled for. But for some of these owners, it also gives them an, uh, an expansion. Uh, you know, it allows them to be the big person in the city. You know, your friends, your family, everybody wants to be, a, you know, on that front row seat and get introduced to players. Second, it also explains why the Saudis and Saudi teams are so interested in buying teams and buying players because it allows them to enter what they feel are the highest ranks of money making. It gives them trophies to take home. And if you bring those two things together with the fact that the winner take all economics of the last 20 or 30 years has created a lot of billionaires, you essentially have the ingredients for why sports franchises have become trophy assets. You've got these scarce assets that give you standing in society. You have billionaires who want toys. It's a match made in heaven. So I'm going to make a, you know, a statement, and I could be proved wrong, that as long as the number of billionaires exceeds the number of sports franchises, this deviation in price and fundamentals that you see with sports franchises is not going to close. And over time, increasingly, sports franchises are going to leave the hands of the old-time owners and end up being expensive toys for very rich people. And they're saying, why should I care? I'm just a fan. I think it has consequences. The consequences for the owners of sports franchises, remember, there are still some holdouts in, among, in each of these sports franchises. Old-time owners, you know, they're going to find themselves competing against people far richer than they are, not just from their team wealth, but from other wealth. There will be pressure to cash out. The Roonies could become billionaires if they cash out. Of course, they have an emotional attachment to the team, but over the generations, that attachment is going to fray. And for those owners of these franchises that are thinking about flipping, selling to these best potential buyers, they want to make their teams look better on a trophy basis. That means signing superstars, even if they're over the hill, because it gives you that shine on your trophy. Moving your team to a different city. Maybe Las Vegas is a better setting for a trophy asset than Oakland. So you're going to see owners who are non-billionaires kind of have to deal with the fact that the rest of the game is shifting. For billionaire owners of franchises, they'll have an expensive toy. Some of them will enjoy the toy, but toys can get boring. And I'd be interested to see what happens when the toy doesn't behave the way you want it to. I expect to see more impatience with managers and players, actions driven by impulse, because that's what toy owners do. And for these billionaire owners, their team is a toy. What about players? As sports franchises become trophy assets, players become the jewels you add to those trophies to add more dazzle. So superstars are going to be priced even higher. 
you want to sign the biggest superstar so you can make your trophy more shiny. So you're going to get a divide where you're going to see numbers and contracts of the superstars in every sport kind of zoom because of this phenomenon. And finally, and, and, and this is just my, my supposition, to the extent that a player's trophy appeal comes not just from how well he or she plays on the pitch, but also from their social media presence and their following. I'll make a prediction. The, pri the contracts you're going to pay, pay for players is not just going to reflect how good they are as players, but how many Twitter followers they bring in, how many Facebook followers they, they can get. I know it's not something I'm looking forward to, but it might be unstoppable. And finally, for fans, what does this mean? If you're a fan of a sports franchise that's owned by somebody who wants to run it as a business, you're going to get frustrated because they can't compete for the most expensive players. So your team is going to lose its biggest stars over time. And you really can't blame the owners. They can't afford to compete against the other owners. If you're a fan of a team with a billionaire owner, you just hit pay dirt, right? That team is going to sign the biggest players, but you're going to get your own share of frustrations. The owner might lose interest in the team. Sometimes toys lose their, their dazzle and they, you know you might get benign neglect. Now, basically what's going to happen in sports France, and the old divide was between rich teams and poor teams, where rich teams were teams with big media contracts, drew a lot, the Yankees versus the Mariners. That contrast is going to be replaced by one way of rich team owners and poorer team owners. And it's going to be an uneven game. And that's why I think the latter group, poor, poorer team owners, are going to get replaced by, by richer team owners who buy teams not as businesses, but as toys. I hope you found the session useful and I look forward to seeing you in a stadium somewhere watching your favorite team. Take care.